Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Brian Ruddle, and, uh, and welcome to the Advancing Regional Innovation Program webinar today. Um, with me today, I've got Paul Russell. Uh, Paul's the Executive Director for Innovation Programming and Partnerships, and we also have Jackie Steele, who's the Director for Engagement and Insights. Uh, the purpose of today's uh, webinar is really to provide an overview of the Advancing Regional Innovation Program. Um, some of the background as to how it was uh, formulated and I suppose the, the application process and, and how we envisage that going forward. Um, in terms of the process though, I'll just get back through there. Um, the process for the format for today uh, is really to sort of you know, do that overview, how to apply, but then the key thing is questions. Uh, so it's focusing in on the questions that um, you know that you have and that you want answered. So in terms of those questions, if you go and uh, have a look at the right hand side. So for those of you who haven't used GoToMeeting before, um, if you go and have a look at the right hand side, um, you'll see there's a questions tab there. Uh, if there's a plus sign, please click on the plus sign and that will expand it out. Uh, we welcome your questions now and then uh, what we'll do is we'll be putting those up on a screen uh, and answering them at the end of the presentation. Also, uh, a copy of today's slide deck is available as well through the GoToMeeting platform. Uh, if, again, on the right hand side of your screen, uh, you'll see a, a tab there for handouts. Again, click on the plus sign and you'll be able to download the, uh, the handouts um, of the presentation today. Uh, just for everyone's information, we are recording this webinar. Uh, so uh, that will be available on the Advanced Queensland website in the next few days. And uh, we can also distribute that to, uh, to those of you who have attended. So Moving on with housekeeping, or after we finish up with the housekeeping there, I'll hand over to Paul to provide us with a, a bit of an overview of the program uh, and sort of how we envisage this being rolled out. Thanks very much, Brian, and good morning to everyone. And certainly the registrations today reflect the diversity and the broad spread of interest right across Queensland in this program. So we very much listened to your input from the consultation process and we've designed hopefully a program that is fit for purpose and that meets the diverse needs of regions across Queensland and also importantly reflects the uh, maturity of different regions along the innovation journey uh, pathway. So I will just take you now through the essence of the program and at the highest level our aim is to build and develop hubs of innovation and enterprise across Queensland. And importantly, the focus isn't just on startups and early stage businesses, although they are important, as are students in the school education system. But it's very much about linking uh, all players together, so startups and entrepreneurs with existing and traditional small businesses in the region, and importantly, with large industry players coming to the table and making contributions to the collaboration plans that we'll talk about in a minute. So we have divided the state up into 12 regions. We looked at different models and it is difficult where you draw the line but we have decided to follow local government boundaries in the main and in some cases we've also focused on our regional development Australia boundaries. Certainly in the case of Ipswich and West Morton and Logan and Redlands and some other key areas. Now I realise that there are always anomalies and some uh, regions would say well we historically half fit into one region and half fit into the other region and there is an opportunity for uh, cross-regional linkages with this program so I'll talk about that in a minute. So each of the 12 regions has been allocated a $500,000 budget over three years for the entire region. We are encouraging pre-registrations for interested parties in each region by Friday next week, close of business, 5pm. 
each application um, should ideally will, will require five partners, a lead applicant and five partners. At least three of those partners must be based in the region. Therefore, two could be based outside the region uh, or in fact could be based outside of the state. Uh, we're not prescriptive about that. And certainly when we, uh, when we receive full applications, when we invite full applications and staged applications, we'll talk about both of those, it's going to be a requirement that you have a minimum core group of five partners who are making co-contributions towards the collaborative action plan that you're proposing. So only applicants who have taken the time and effort to pre-register by next Friday will be eligible to progress to the application stage, which technically will open on Monday the 21st of November. So where we have a single united application from a region, and it's the only one we have, we will invite that lead applicant and their partners to then work on either a staged or a full application, depending on how far they are progressed with the proposed collaboration or collaborative action plan. Where we get um, multiple pre-registrations as of close of business on Friday the 18th, we will consider uh, the composition of those pre-registrations and we will make contact, the department will make contact with each of those proponents for a discussion around the opportunity to have a workshop um, to discuss mutual interests to hopefully find a unified um, opportunity to go forward with either a staged or a full application um, in due course. Um, where proponents are still un, undecided or are not advanced around what would be the composition of their collaborative action plan, therefore they require a staged application which will be open until the end of February, the 28th of February next year. We are setting aside $20,000 out of the $500,000 per region as a funding contribution towards getting the parties together to hopefully work on a unified approach and build the collaborative, collaborative action plan as part of that. We're not prescriptive about who the proponents would use. You are free to select an agent or a consultant or an advisor to work with, but there is 20,000 per region uh, and it's limited to the 20,000. So once, if that funding is called upon, that will diminish the overall $500,000 budget for the three-year program to the extent that that funding is required um, to complete the collaborative action plan. Um, if a regional consortium is in a position to go forward and doesn't need the staged application process, they can go forward with a full application and lodge it with us as soon as it's ready to be lodged. But we have the window of opportunity open until the 20. 8th of April next year, so it's virtually six months um, in that circumstance. We are setting up an assessment panel um, who will assess all full applications. Even a single application from a region will be assessed by the assessment panel against the assessment criteria that are in the, um, that are in the guidelines. We'll cover that in a minute. We do require matched funding, one-to-one -one, over the course of the three years, doesn't, always, doesn't all have to occur in the first year, but over the full time frame of the application, there must be evidence that the collaboration partners and other, and other supporters in the region or outside the region are at least contributing one-for-one -one matched funding. So we have a, a requirement that 50% of the match funding must come from non-government sources. And we've had a few questions on non-government sources. For instance, a company limited by guarantee that's 
you know, set up for the purpose of economic development or regional development, etc., would be eligible for would fit into the criteria of, of a non-government funding partner. Obviously, business organisations, industry organisations, and universities fit into that um, category as well. So, 50% of the cash funding must come for 250,000 over the time frame. Three years must come from that that source. Up to 25% of the cash can come from other government, local government or Australian government, but not from state government. And 25% can come from in-kind sources, combined, government and non-government sources. So the key point is here, you don't have to achieve those targets in your first year, but you have to demonstrate you're achieving those targets, that one-to-one -one matching, over the proposed lifetime of the project. In most cases, that'll be three years. Um, activities to be conducted under the region's collaborative action plan are to be undertaken in a primary location. So the primary location would be one city or town. And then we are requiring proponents to nominate at least two outreach locations in their region, so in their region, not outside of their region. And 20% of the funding being sought and allocated must be towards supporting activities in those outreach locations. So I might just move to the next slide. And, um, so the program aims to support the development and increased maturity of regional innovation across Queensland. So recognising that some regions are well advanced on the journey and have uh, have an ecosystem or the, or the beginnings of an ecosystem in place and are looking to take that to the next level. And other regions are at the very early stage. And so the focus of their collaboration plans will be vastly different. The key point that I would make is that this program is designed as a fit for purpose program. So the proponents and their partners get to choose a range of activities to nominate for funding that they believe are appropriate for their circumstances uh, and the needs of that region going forward. And there's nothing to stop regions from cooperating and collaborating with one another as well. So the four key objectives of the program and the evaluation criteria is weighted to reflect this. Collaboration is by far and away the highest level objective and 40% of the assessment criteria is allocated towards the collaboration action plan. So encouraging stakeholders to show how they will collaborate closely to build innovation capability over the tenure of their plan. Second principle is leverage. In other words, ensuring activities have broad support and contributions from multiple partners. And again, I would really like to emphasise, we'll be looking for support from small and medium businesses in the region, and we'll be very much looking for support from one or two major industries in the region behind the program. Obviously, there's opportunities depending on the regions for universities, and research organisations, but that, that's according to each regional circumstance. Obviously, we want this program to seed and kickstart an innovation ecosystem in each of the regions and a linked statewide approach to innovation support and entrepreneurship. So the third principle is about sustainability. So hence the reason why the matched funding is as it is over the three years. We really would like to see evidence that at the end of the third year that there is uh, the very likelihood that there will be continuity of the program. And we don't know what three years time will, will deliver for us in government, but that's very much our expectation. And then the fourth principle or objective is around impact. So supporting activities that will make a demonstrable difference 
to the innovation driven opportunities and very much job, uh, businesses of the future and jobs of the future in regional Queensland and help to transition some of the traditional businesses and industries in Queensland for the future. So the evaluation criteria are very much weighted um, in this, in, according to these objectives. Of course, 20% is also value for money, um, which is uh, which is very common criteria in government. Right? I might just yeah. um, so that's that's a high level overview. What I should say also is in respect to some um, rural and remote areas of the state, if you take the time to read the guideline under matched funding requirement on page two, I just highlight that the panel of assessors in considering regional proposals can make recommendations to the department to vary the contribution mix requirement based on regional circumstances as outlined in the proposal. So there is a little bit of scope to take account of the unique circumstances of some of our rural and remote areas of Queensland. So I might um, stop at that point and invite Jackie. Yep. Oh, actually, I, I get to go oh, in. Sorry, sorry. sorry. That's right. Uh, look, thanks very much for that, Paul. Um, I just uh, remind everyone about uh, putting your questions uh, in or sending your questions through because um, you know with this program uh, we didn't when we first started having a, a look at um, this sort of whole concept of regional ecosystems. It wasn't a case of, of going overseas and looking at what other governments have done. It was really a case of looking at what Queensland needed. And, and part of that was sort of listening through this whole public consultation process. And so we thought that uh, it would be useful just to provide some feedback because I know that a lot of you that are online today uh, participated in those regional consultations. Um, and I suppose that there were, you know, there were some key aspects there that helped guide the framework. Uh, that we ended up building around this particular program. So the, the first point there is that really it is a program that needs to be designed by the regions for the regions. And this came out very, very clearly that there was concern uh, by a number of proponents in uh, regional Queensland that this would be a, another program designed and developed in Brisbane um, without really taking into consideration the unique requirements of different regions. And this really came out, uh, particularly because we ended up running 14 uh, regional consultations. And each region, or each of those consultations, if you like, brought out the uniqueness of the regions. And so that really came into play in terms of how we built the framework and really focused on having uh, flexibility in terms of implementation. The second part was that we, you know, we were getting feedback that the program really has to have this community building potential. Um, that there was concerns that uh, different groups would sort of, if you like, treat this like uh, a normal government grant funding program, where you sort of you get the grant funds, uh, then you implement them yourselves, and um, you know it adds value to your business or your organisation, and so. That was another key part of the feedback that we needed to build a framework with this particular program to build communities, to have a, an approach where people can come together and work together to build ecosystems. And so while Paul's sort of gone through and he's, he's talked about um, you know, the need for lead proponents and, and things like that, the main reason for that is that we need to have a contract or an agreement uh, between the Queensland Government and the proponent to allow the transfer of funds. The concept behind having the partners behind that lead proponent is that the implementation and the engagement needs to really focus on this community building. The third thing was really building on the strengths of what's already happening. And again, this was a concern that was raised in a number of the, uh, the consultations that we conducted, that, if, you know, that a program would be developed that didn't recognise the hard work that individuals have already put into building their regional ecosystems, to supporting um, you know, new startups, running incubators, bringing in SMEs and the like. And so that was the other part of not restricting this program so that new players can't come in, they can definitely come on board with all of this, 
but it was also recognising the strengths and trying to build on the strengths and the programs and processes that people have already started putting in place. The other key part of that is we didn't want something that was going to be competing. It needed to be additive. The fourth point there is um, you know, recognising that the leadership needed to come from the regions. Um, and, and this was really important because at the end of the day, if these ecosystems are going to have that sustainability, and again, picking up on Paul's point, this is a key requirement. And I suppose a key concern, again, when we were sort of building um, this out, was that we needed to have some sustainability. You know, we're very fortunate from an innovation community broadly that the government is supporting this program. We've got support for three years. What we want, and this is part of the matching contributions, the part of the engagement with a number of different stakeholders, is we want to build in the sustainability. And so that's going to be very important, um, you know, as, as we go forward with that. And that's leadership, that local leadership is a key part of that. Linked with that is supporting the local leadership. And this was another key thing that kept coming out a lot in the consultations. Um, the current leaders are running their own businesses. They're running their own startups. The reason that they're really passionate about sort of driving innovation in their particular locations is because they get a kick out of it, which is fantastic. And so, but this program, if it's going to succeed and have that sustainability, needs to support those leaders and sort of help, if you like, fund that support structure around the existing leaders um, so that um, you know, the, the, the ecosystem is growing and it is not constrained by the amount of time that the current leaders have at the moment. And the final thing there is sort of really focusing on the emerging leaders, um, you know, helping to foster emerging leaders in, in the region. So again, picking up on sustainability, we've got a better chance that in you know, three, four, five, ten years' time, um, you know, we can all look back at this program and say, yes, this was a catalyst, this was the initial support to help build the regional ecosystems and that we've got this emerging leaders type program coming through uh, with the next generation of leaders. So that's just a, a quick overview, if you like, of some of the key findings that, that came about from the regional consultations. And I think you can see the links with a lot of those key points in terms of how we ended up building the framework for this uh, this particular program. So with that, I'll hand over to Jackie now, who will sort of take us through um, some of the aspects about how to apply and then also next steps. Uh, and as I said before, um, I really encourage you to you know, type in your questions and then uh, after that we'll start going through a lot of those questions and providing those answers. So Jackie. Thank you. Um, I know you, this is a lot of information to take in and you probably have a few questions. So I will focus on um, some key points so that we've got yep. some time for those questions um, as quickly as possible. The main thing that I would ask you all to focus on at this point in time is the pre-registration. As we've mentioned a couple of times, pre-registration is about nominating your interest for this program. People that pre-register are the people that will be taken through and are eligible to apply. So you need to get together in your regions to come together as a group and put in that pre-registration. We would love, like if there's time, if there's already collaborations happening, that those groups are already united and we get a nice united um, pre-registration and there's one application in a region and those, that group can move forward quickly in the program. But, you know, we can also work with the interested parties as soon as we know who is there to bring those groups together to work through what needs to be done in your region and, and to work through what's happening in your region and how to best suit this program to, to your stakeholders and to the groups that have come forward. So please focus on the pre-registration as the first step. Um, then it will open for applications and we've gone through the fact that you can either do a staged application to support your collaborative action plan or if you're already at that point, you can move directly into the full application. And we want to make sure that all of those applications are progressed and in place by um, 28th of April next year. 
but you can submit at any time. When we receive them, we will progress them. And that's the reason for pre-registration, so that we've got that certainty. We know who we're going to deal with in the region, and we know the budget that, that we can work to in to each of those lead applicants. Um, so what you can do now is about the pre-registration. Start talking to people in your region. Um, you know, If you went to one of the workshops, um, I think a lot of those workshops, people nominated a, a coordinator or group area. Uh, Department of State Development are helping us in the region, so they would be a really great contact. Or um, you can contact us here if you're not sure who to talk to or who might be involved from your region. Um, and then and you can start to talk about you know, how it might work for you. What activities do you need? And who do you need to get on board in order to make those activities happen? Um, there's been a lot of discussion in the things that I've had so far around the lead applicant and what that means. Um, what I would say is that some organisations are better equipped and better resourced to do the administrative requirements of a program like this, to equip the funds, to deal with government, to, to do that administrative process. That doesn't have to be the same person that does the innovation activities or a range of other activities that need to happen in your region to make this program work. So think very carefully about who's best placed to do each of the things that need to be done, who's best placed to lead, and who needs to be freed up from some of that requirement to do other things. So we go into an agreement with the lead applicant, but at a regional level, the collaborative action plan and any other structures or agreements that you put in place is what is um, is, is what sort of tells people what their contribution is and what their role is, and essentially what their power is in terms of um, making a contribution to this program. So you don't have to be lead applicant to do the things that you think need to be done in this program. So please take that on board. Um, everybody has a role to play. So think about what you bring best to that table. Um, there is a number of resources to help you online and um, I encourage you to have a look at those. The frequently asked questions are really good and quite detailed. Um, the program guidelines, we've tried to make that um, nice and clear and simple and there's also a, an applicant handbook and other things. So have a look at those. If you still have some specific questions or you're not clear on some of the stuff, there is an email address and during business hours we have a phone number to get directly to one of the offices. So please take advantage of that information online. But again, I'd point you towards the pre-registration process is the most important thing at the moment so that we can understand who's interested in your region and what they want to bring to this program. Yeah. No, that's great. Thanks, Jackie. And I'll just make one comment about the pre-registration program and the reason that we set this up uh, was that while many of you uh, that are online today participated in the regional uh, consultation workshops, there's a number that didn't. And so we didn't want to start this program with people saying, well, we weren't aware or, or there wasn't a way for us to get involved. So this pre-registration process uh, isn't uh, a detailed process, but it's really trying to understand who's interested in being a lead applicant. Um, and then, as Paul mentioned, if we end up with a number of uh, lead applicants um, you know, and, and groups, if you like, within a particular region, then what we're going to be doing is trying to work with those groups to see whether we can bring the whole thing together into one application wherever possible. And the reason for this comes back to that sustainability point that I made earlier on. If we end up having different groups doing the same thing, uh, there's a few things that are going to happen. Number one, it's uh, sustainability um, is probably going to be a little bit harder to achieve. But secondly, for you know, entrepreneurs, startups, and SMEs in other businesses, other organisations, not for profits and the like, all of a sudden it becomes a little bit confusing as to how they engage because there's multiple groups. But if they're doing the same thing, um, it, it just becomes a bit more difficult to try to get that um, that impact that we're all looking for with this particular program. So Brian, could I also make just two quick points? Um, the lead applicant in this pre-registration process may be one party, but when they develop their uh, stage application or their full application, the lead applicant may change for the purpose of the final application. Mm -hmm. 
the lead applicant now gets you on the, on the, on, the, on the track basically. Yeah. Okay, so you do have flexibility. You can change um, over time. And the second thing is uh, we have also put up on the website uh, a PDF version of what the full application document would look like, so people can get a look at what the, yeah. the information fields are that they will be needing to address. Yeah, thanks. No, that's great. Okay, so we might move now on to uh, questions.